Um, so we're very excited to work with NCLR. We've done one reading before and we're doing the second one now. Um, and they've been such wonderful partners and um, I've learned so much and I know um, everybody who's attended really, really enjoyed it. Um, and we're so excited to have so many fabulous poets here tonight. Um, and so I'm gonna turn it over to Mary and she is going to take it from there. Thank you, Sean. Hey everyone, and thanks for tuning in tonight to the James Applewhite Poetry Prize virtual reading. My name is Mary Myers, and I'm an editorial assistant with the North Carolina Literary Review. First off, I'd like to shake, thank Sean Holland Moore. She's been hard at work keeping the technology in check for tonight and has been a pleasure in helping plan this event. Thank you to the ECU Alumni Association for co-hosting. Welcome to all the ECU alumni in the audience, as well as to our editor, Margaret Bauer, who's watching from her home. She sends thanks to all of you for being here tonight. The James Applewhite Poetry Prize competition was created in 2011 to honor the renowned North Carolina poet. The first Applewhite Prize winner was published in NCLR in 2012. The competition is open to any writer who fits the NCLR definition of a North Carolina writer. Anyone who currently lives in North Carolina, who has lived in North Carolina, or uses North Carolina as a subject matter. The poetry submissions do not have to relate to an issue special feature topic. Applewhite submissions are accepted through, uh, through April 30th. The winner receives $250 and a publication in NCLR. Finalists will also be considered for publication, and we are proud to say that this year, all poets whose poems are published in NCLR and NCLR online will receive honoraria from $25 to $100 from the funding NCLR receives from the NC Literary and Historical Association. To find out more about the Applewhite Prize, you can go to www.nclr.ecu.edu slash submissions. If you enjoy this event, make sure to subscribe to NCLR to receive the 30th annual print issue, which will re be released this summer. It features the first, second, third, and honorable mention poems of the 2020 Applewhite Poetry Prize, which you'll hear later tonight. Anyone at this event who subscribes tonight or tomorrow, forward us your receipt in an email and we'll send you a free copy of the 2007 issue, which featured 100 years of writers and writing at ECU and included an interview with our poetry editor, Jeff Franklin. If you already have it, just let us know and we'll send you a back issue featuring poetry by our final judge, Catherine Carter. Before we switch gears to hear some wonderful poetry, we ask that you take a second to answer a quick poll question. And without further ado, I'll turn it over to the other ECU students serving on the NCLR staff who will help introduce our poets tonight. Thanks, Mary. Hello, my name is Elizabeth. And as Mary said, I am an intern, oh, I'm an intern with NCLR. David E. Poston's work has appeared most recently in Atlanta Review, Pedestal Magazine, Flying South and Moonshine Review. His latest poetry collection, Slow of Study, was published in 2015 by Main Street Rag and reviewed in NCLR 2017. He lives in Gastonia, North Carolina, where he teaches occasional writing workshops for hospice and other venues and serves as a co-editor of Cacalac. His poem, She Being Holy Ghost, placed third for the 2020 Applewhite Poetry Prize. Please welcome David Poston. Thank you. Thank you for the chance to be here. I see some folks I have not seen in a long time. I'm glad to see a couple that I have and a lot of what look like happy new faces. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to read. Um, this may be the perfect time of year for me to read this poem being just after Easter. She being Holy Ghost. Past Rock City and the cattle on a thousand hills, broken trees poke through the gray wool of the late winter mountainside, waiting for rapture to seize the dogwoods below them. Stones lie scattered like pillows in white water, bleeding out into the calmness, spooling under the footbridge across the Davidson. Trout float all day in the shadows, facing upstream toward Pisgah, 
and beyond the back country called Shining Rock, thick with bears. And she, being Holy Ghost, is neither hawk nor wind under wing, is not turn of leaf and laurel thicket, nor any of the thousand shades of grain shadowed by clouds rolling over balls, nor any shadow passing swiftly across the land. She is not bear or scent of bear, or chill prickling the hiker's neck at seeing the hunched shape too big for dog. She is not the pause between the spondees of the quickened heart, or the synapses filing, firing muscles for flight. Not the dimple in the water where the mayfly lands, nor the shimmer of the rising trout. She is not the sweeping in the towns below at day's end across worn floors of barber shops nor the young girls circling the camp meeting ground each fall in threes and fours, eyeing boys. She is neither baby's cry nor moss on tombstones, neither the darting nor the dimming of eyes. Yet without her, there is no telling. Thank you. Beautiful point. Thank you, David, for sharing your wonderful work. My name is Bethany Holmes, and I'm an editorial assistant at NCLR. I have the pleasure of introducing the 2020 second place Apple White poet, Gideon Young. Gideon is a member of the Carolina African American Writers Collective and the Carborough Poets Council. He is the author of the poetry collection, My Hands Full of Light, published this spring, and one of the authors included in One Wind Windows Light, a collection of haiku which was reviewed in NCLR online 2019 and won the Haiku Society America Merit Award for Best Anthology. Please welcome Gideon Young. Hooray, thank you so much. Um, thank you to the staff at North Carolina Literary Review, Dr. Bauer, Jeff Franklin, and especially North Carolina Poet Laureate Jackie Shelton Green uh, for her final judge work. I'm excited to be here with everyone and read. I'm going to read the longest poem um, that I've had published. And I feel like I'm in the middle of a dichotomy because my book just published is Haiku. Uh, you can find it on gideonyoung.com. And the poem I'm gonna to read tonight is called Kwan Saba Crown. A Kwan Saba is an African-American praise poem. It is seven lines, seven words in each line, and no word has more than seven letters. Um, and this poem is seven of those uh, interlocked. So each, the last line of each becomes the first line of the next. I'm gonna play a little flute and then go right into it. country says you were born flying in the face of its oldest rule brown and loved we lift you up cradle your warm face to our faces the murmur and spark of your skin your blood crossed over ocean and swung the lash your wings gold and fire Lash your wings with gold and fire. Invent fine knots that have no names. Tie them snug around your green bones. This world wants to watch you fray. Won't warn you the term for loop is I. An eye that slips is called noose. You keep you in view. Our name anew, keep you in view. Pray the spirits of our spiral cells, their hope, tall drums, tight, deep, boom. Battle dance of spun blood toward light. Each jitter red drop an elder eye. 
Under your skin, their buzz a blue, ancient chorus hums power in your moves. Ancient chorus hums power in your moves. I know from the clatter how elegant your elbows bend to cast rainbow blocks across our ash floors. You unbuild towers we made of selves before you sparked. Your small fingers offer us bright bricks. More again, you say without saying, here. More again, you say without saying, here. Watch me sway, but stand. Toes curled, press my bones, weight into ash floors. Yet of bones into ash, into dust, I know nothing of winter except winter. An absence of wild geese, early evening sun on silver limbs, your lifted gaze. Sun on silver limbs, your lift of gaze burns away all of me but memory. How your skull above your ears fit in the cradle of my spread fingers. Your soft spot exact to the center of my palm, our pulse, same rhythm, spring breeze charms the air with lilac. Spring breeze charms the air with lilac. You ignore the grass between your toes. New word, more. A wren takes wing out from the crayon in your fist. Acorn filled with earth, hear my yearn. My blood near yours forever. I know this world sings. You were born flying. Thanks, y'all. That was exceptional. Thank you for being here and for sharing your art, Gideon. Sharing her first place Apple White Prize poem is Keely Hendricks. Keely is a recent graduate from the UNC Chapel Hill, where she earned a BA in English Literature and French with a concentration in creative writing. Final judge and North Carolina Poet Laureate Jackie Shelton Green described her winning selection as atmospherically rich with a delicate musicality. This was Hendrick's first time submitting her poetry for NCLR's Apple White competition, as well as her first time to submit her poetry for publication consideration. Please join me in welcoming the 2020 prize winning poet, Keely Hendricks. Thank you, Mary. Um, thank you, NCLR staff. It's so nice to actually see your faces. And I can't just, I'm overwhelmed by looking at this screen of about half of y'all are my educators from seventh grade and a few of y'all are educators that I teach alongside now which is a pretty cool progression and I wish we were in a physical room so y'all could mingle and and get to know each other because you've all been such important influences in my life and I, I feel your presence in the zoom <laughs> abundance I once read of a biologist who asked to be laid to rest in the forest of Brazil so the giant winged scarab would lay its young in his body. No worm for me nor sordid fly, I will buzz in the dusk, be born body by flying body, lofted under those beautiful and unfused elytra which we will all hold over our backs. Meanwhile, in the dusk outside my window, the red-headed woodpecker fills its paunch with stupefied ants. They pour out from the tree and into his black, wet throat, dazed by the sunlight and heat, seeking the dark, closed-in feeling. They spill out like the sap my great-grandmother tapped from Arkansas oaks when she was a girl, and her father let her hold the bucket under the tree, and later under the slit neck of a hog. They prayed for milk and rain. They buried their children in the cemetery outside the one-room schoolhouse. I never learned how. The molasses of her childhood will not keep or be replenished. It breathes in the damp and must be tossed out. Oh, but the honey. The honey still tastes the way it did from her mother's finger. Embalms memory and phalanx, brims in the great sarcophagus, mellified king of abundance. The poor ancients surfeited on honey to mummify like candy, become a remedy for bones. 
My great grandmother's remedy for living was crochet, milk, tap, slit, rub the men's shoulders at dusk time. Adam's curse, cure your pig, salt it with the sweat of slaughter and harvest, hunger for your God and you will never famish. When my great grandmother pats my hand, I see the purple spider webs strung between the rafters of her bones. She must soak her bread in milk to swallow. The purple martins she loves have not flown the gourds her mother carved. They devour mosquitoes quietly, joyously. They will never go hungry in summertime. She celebrated surfeit with the gift of a dark, plentiful womb. They wove their nests with the golden strands of her hair, which she plucked from her brush and let catch on the wind outside her window. Their nests turned gray with the birth and burial of daughters. The archeologists did not actually find honey on the bodies of the dead. Their bones were simply covered in flower pollen and in bees broken toes. Does the Arkansas tick seed and chicory grow from the soil of their sockets? Does she pluck coneflower and phlox to remember them by? I wonder how she lives through another winter without birdsong or super bloom. She is patient, ancient hearted, her bones are the scaffolding of a house of God. She defies the theory of aging that the biologist discovered before he died, taken by the fevers of malaria. His body began its incarnation into scarab in the jungle of milk and honey. So finally, I too will shine like a violet ground beetle under a stone, he wrote, before his life multiplied, poured forth, seeking the tomb of resurrection. Thank you, Keely. I'm looking forward to seeing your poem as well and all the Apple White, oh, eh, I'm so sorry, all the Apple White honorees in this print issue coming in the summer. At this time, we will hear Jody Barnes, who has been published in Tupelo Quarterly, Camrock Press Review, Prime Number Magazine, 100 Word Story, Walter, Wigleaf Top 50, and Fiction Art Editor's Eye. She received the Luskow Prize in Flash Fiction in 2014, and in 2010, she was runner up for the Oscar Arnold Young Award. She currently resides in Athens, Georgia. Please welcome Jody Barnes. Thank you so much. And it's, a, it's an honor to be here, and it's so nice to see your faces. Some of you I haven't seen in years um, and, and meet meet new folks. So lots, lots of books that I'm ordering very soon of the readers. And probably if we have more reading, I'm, I'm not sure what the agenda is, but um, this is very soul filling for me. Um, I'm going to read a poem that's fairly short. And by the way, I wanted to say that um, I consider North Carolina my home. I was born in Illinois, but I, I lived the longest stretch of years in North Carolina. And I have family there. And so, um, yeah, it'll always be home to me. Uh, this next poem is, is fairly short. I, it took me about five years to know that it was right to be able to submit. And so I just want to offer that. It's not a, it's not a, a, you know, directive or anything like that. But if some of you get frustrated with a poem and you know that there are good bones there, there are good elements, um, just stick with it. And I, I wrote this originally in New York. My daughter's on this call and I very much appreciate her and love her. Um, and this is where she worked at the time about five years ago, Allie Bill. And, it, and so I'll just start, but um, Hopefully you can hear a little bit of music, even though I didn't bring my flute, Gideon. I, I, I do play the flute and I enjoyed your, thank you so much for accompanying that piece. This is At the Gray Dog in Chelsea. Between sips of a three shot latte, I stare at a wall older than ragtime. Each brick, a black key once set in ivory, its mortar now grayed or gone. I hear both Joplins, Maple Leaf, Bobby McGee, 
smell the whiskey and weed, then back to the whir of a grinder, hip strangers and gentrified beans. Three beautiful people squeeze onto a bench at my table. They bring no music or desire. What civilized liars we become when native strains of lust have no place to play. I reach for my empty cup, but it's heavy as an old piano. Bathed in pendant spotlight, it waits for a barista who smells of sex and milk. Nice, very nice. Thank you. Thank you, Jody. Next up, we have Terry Greco. She was a Gilbert Chapel Distinguished Adult Student Poet 2017-2018 and received an award of honorable mention for her poem, Living in the 2019 Cackalack Contest. In her first submission to NCLR, she was awarded honorable mention for the 2020 Applewhite Poetry Prize for her poem, After Perfecting a Coconut Cream Pie, I Fail. Please welcome Terry Greco. Thank you so much. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the ECU Alumni Association for sponsoring this event. The North Carolina Literary Review, Dr. Bauer, Mary Myers, um, and all the staff, and especially thanks to Jeff Franklin for having faith in and selecting this poem. And, you know, like David, this is an Easter poem, so that's a coincidence. Maybe there's something about Easter poems. And I'm really humbled and honored to be here with all of you, so thank you for coming. And I'm really humbled, honestly, to have written a poem about a pie that made it to this reading. So that should give you some inspiration. After perfecting a coconut cream pie, I fail. Easter weekend and its complex contradictions. Holy Thursday, undercurrent of foreboding. Good Friday, all black sky and tornadoes, bad enough to stay at home until Saturday's sun dried the roads, still steeping at the edges from flooded lawns. In Target, I tailed other mothers on the hunt for the last of neon peeps and jelly beans. I've never thought it sensible to follow murder with a peace offering, but I still do it. I had no business making a pie that wasn't my own. No experience with pie dough, double boilers, egg custard. We want what we want when we want it, need it. And there I was watching Better Homes and Gardens test kitchen on YouTube, cutting and shortening, scraping flour with a fork, scrapping mushy paste, starting again and again until a ball had formed. What a joy it was to roll out my own slab, lay it tenderly in Pyrex like a sleeping baby, slid from my arms to the crib. And when it didn't cry, I had the confidence to squat on my toes at the mouth of the oven and wait for coconut to brown, turning it patiently. Then whip the heavy cream until it splattered the counter, blender, refrigerator. Custard came together when I placed a mixing bowl over boiling water, as though I always knew to do it, watching until egg coated this spatula. Magazine photo gorgeous, the pie filled and filled me until Monday, when I walked into my lost promotion, a less experienced girl ready to direct me with unshakable nerve like the girl I was a decade ago, more than a decade ago, sitting at the foot of a man, bright-eyed and believing the world would treat me fairly and I would have earned it. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Terry, and to all of our Apple White readers. Tonight, we have a few special guests joining us. First up, Dr. Jeffrey Franklin, who is the poetry editor at the, <clears throat> excuse me, at the North Carolina Literary Review. He has been a professor at the University of Colorado, Denver since 2000. Jeffrey has published three scholarly books, one prior poetry collection titled For the Lost Boys, 
and has a new collection forthcoming this year titled Where We Lay Down, from which he'll read this evening. Please help me in welcoming, welcoming Jeffrey Franklin. Thank you, Bethany. And it's a real pleasure and an honor to be amongst all of you. Thank you. I'm going to read two short poems. Um, and the first one is called Magali's Polo Grounds. And it's based on a beautiful poem by James Fenton called In a Notebook. I borrowed his form for this poem. There was a gray plank barn submerged in amber where we fought duels among the tack room shadows. Shelved by the magazine of mallets and spurs were tins painted with a thoroughbred's derby pose, laced the smells of hay and urine with camphor. Mud daubers spit and pasted Quonset chateaus where swallows dipped through summer's furnace door and the dirt floor quaked when in a heated chukka, the ponies charged the barn end goal like thunder. The loft was stacked with bales up to the eaves and where their stagger left slim corridors, we tunneled courses deep on our hands and knees, a sudden rat as good as a minotaur. Astride the fence, we tracked our father's jerseys Beneath the stands, eavesdropped on chatting mothers, loosened to high cackles by daiquiris. The wheeling mounts, the whip of mallets, the blur and weave of scrimmage made an elegant war. But we slipped off before the final pistol to wade the creek that ran beside the grounds. Roots laddered to glassy sun-streaked pools moss-backed rocks beneath which crawdads crowned with jellied eyes and red antennae, cruel claws big as lobsters reared to face us down. Black and red feathers fanned to a paisley swirl in one pool where a leghorn rooster drowned, a kaleidoscopic eddy turning round. There was an oval in the sun the rule of fathers rearing above us like minotaurs. Young men beyond their means, not long from school, their mortgaged businesses, an elegant war for which weekend mock chivalry was cruel reward. They swapped and then divorced our mothers. But we slipped off before the final pistol like whiffs of hay and urine laced with camphor and disappeared through summer's furnace door. And this poem um, is actually said, I felt like I had to read it. It's, it's set at Chippendale Drive in Greenville, North Carolina. And uh, several years after we left North Carolina and moved to Colorado, um, I wrote this poem thinking about my children and uh, sort of, um, visited their old rooms there in Greenville. The persistence of place. Already my ghost is fading from those rooms. These rooms, now that habit of thoughts transported me back to inhabit them once more. Like all ghosts, I've forgotten what it is I ought to be seeking here in the stunned vacancy of our den in the perpetual dusk of nostalgia, and so find myself lingering, peering about absent-mindedly, an unexpected guest in my own past life. My children are living happily in another city with me, but I miss them, orphaned as they now are from a place of the childhood they don't yet know was theirs. So I drift through their rooms, a diver revisiting spectral gangways and cabins, or like the man who goes to work and returns home to find everything inexplicably gone, dents in the carpets, fill in the blank dust patterns, and can only stare with rapturous fascination 
at details that never were so much themselves. This wall's geography of rivering cracks and continental stains, that odd wedge of shelves beneath the stairs, these porcelain clothes hooks. Startling, so much of us is absent, absence. I sometimes think we are the places we've lived, less that we leave behind some part of us than that each leaves in us a part of it, becoming the map that guides as we fill it in. Like all ghosts, I go on hungering to settle with myself, but I'm not home yet again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff, for being here and sharing your work with all of us. And thank you for all the work that you put into NCLR. Following Jeff, we have the pleasure of hearing Wayne Johns. Wayne was the first place winner of the 2019 Apple White Poetry Prize. And during our first virtual event last year, we unfortunately lost internet before he could read his poem. We thank him for joining us tonight to read it and another Apple White finalist poem that we've published. Please help me in welcoming Wayne Johns. Thank you. Can you hear me this time? <laughs> it's great to be here and I'm just, you know, super honored. I think the, the work is also excellent. So thanks a lot. I'm going to read two. Uh, so renovations. I should have paid more attention. Tried to get a little closer as a child, watching my father restore, rewire, repair, then scale a ladder and walk across the ceiling of the world. He was always going up, coming down with tools, bucket, cigarette, balanced in calloused hands. I can't really say, since we never touched, his hands were rough. That isn't true. He'd hold his index finger out as if pointing at me during mother's prayers at supper. And I'd take it without question like an infant, because holding hands is intimate, effeminate, and only gluttons and ingrates dare to ask for more than they've been given. But given all he did for a living, his hands must have been rough. Not for a living, just to provide the roof, the food, the yard. He also fed and buried all the pets, birds, rabbits, cats, dogs, in the back corner of the yard. Even the runt our mutt kept pushing from the box. I kept putting it back, tried to feed it with a the dropper, then watched from inside as he jabbed the ground dug his heel into the rolled shoulder of the shovel and stomped. Over and over, I watched, so I'd know where to dig. Though I don't know what I thought I'd find, it goes without saying, you never thanked him. You never even knew his silence was a kind of kindness. Um, next, uh, this one, uh, Meditation in a Glass House. Morning Glory claimed the unmown field behind the house, even started scaling the stricken pecan, its fallen nuts unripe or rotten, split black casings twisted into stars against the colorless sky. The trumpet flowers distend in the sun like blown glass. Stand still an hour and watch them shrivel. Up close, the pale ones have lavender pistols like the inside of a shell a place where something slick lived. I keep wondering about these marks we leave in passing, how we're marked by what passes, flickering shadow of a flock heading south. You never see so many in the city. Did you know morning glory flowers don't have any scent? They're just like the hummingbirds that sip from their balloons and cannot sing though their throats are flames. A silence encloses the field. Church bells in the distance. Children let out onto a playground and then this pulsing stillness. Walking back to the empty house, I find a cicada casing, papery as a vespiary after all the wasps have flown. The way after you were gone, the house was just this tissue thin layer of skin over my days. I watched a cicada drain new leaves once. It clung to the stem and wouldn't stop, even when touched. 
A hunger like that seems indistinguishable from passion. It must require such level of devotion to split your own shell and fly into a new life. Some moments it seems so simple to believe in a place where morning glory overtakes the world until the first frost leaves shed petals like blued eyelids cased in ice. Each as it melts must be pried completely open. Thank you, Wayne. To close out our wonderful group of poets, we have Catherine Carter, our 2021 Applewhite Poetry Prize final judge. Dr. Catherine Carter currently serves as a professor at Western Carolina University, where she teaches English education, grammar, and writing. Her research explores poetry and 20th century American English, including a now forgotten author, Kathleen Thompson Norris. She is the author of the poetry collections, Marks of the Witch, The Swamp Monster at Home, The Memory of Gills, and Larva of the Nearest Stars. Her work has appeared in English Education, Studies in American Fiction, Plowshares, Tar River Poetry, and Best American Poetry 2009, among others. Tonight, she'll be reading her 2018 Applewhite Poetry Prize winning poem, Womb Room, followed by a new poem, Ode Yeast, forthcoming this year in the North American Review. Please give it up for Katherine Carter. Thank you all so much. I certainly appreciate the opportunity to read with you tonight. I just had to make the cat get down. Um, the uh, first poem, uh, Womb Room. Um, both of these poems really cross into the too much information zone. But um, the inside of the uterus is something we virtually never see. Um, and some years ago in the midst of a procedure, it turns out that they can cast it up onto a screen and I was able to see it and it was not like I pictured. And that was the impetus for womb room. You always pictured it black in there. If less black like a windowless underground cell then black as an iris, a silky queen of night tulip, why not? But the speculum saw, stabbing its annual spear of light, you never did. That room had neither sun nor sea, nor even the blood tide moon. Only now there's the screen, its mystic mirror promising terrible truths. Now, now, here's all you never thought to see. And it's not black. No tulip cup, no sealed cell, but a witch cathedral of rose quartz, peony petals, arched, vaulted, glimmering with moisture like the geode walls of hidden caverns at the first candlelight in that deep underground. Made to hold a life it couldn't hold, still this could be a secret chamber of Loray, Fingal, Lascaux, this room inside yourself into which you could almost step, whose curved walls you could almost inscribe with ochre does, cows, mares, wild cats, new countries, charts of unnamed stars. And on the uh, assumption that that was not enough too much information, um, I have gotten interested in odes of recent years and uh, this one is an ode to yeast and probably all of you are familiar with yeast and you know that it's a fungus, it's kind of a kissing cousin to the mushroom. And it lives in all kinds of parts of our bodies all the time. And given the opportunity, it is prone to expand and overfluoresce and kind of take over things. And so I was thinking of yeast and uh, all the various places it likes to propagate when I wrote this poem. Ode Yeast. Crop dust with turconazole, lay down mycostatin in swaths. Yeasts, which should be brewing beer, raising bread, now ferment your tenderest parts. Raise white cheeses on vulva or tongue, 
sing their mycelial exuberances would thrush clear if you knew how to hear. Embrace any poison to seize back your own territories, the parts you prefer dedicated to pleasure. But as resident yeasts writhe and shriek under napalm smears, pause to wonder, what if? If the zombie, if the zombie ant fungus, famous for scourging its host to high places, to burst forth a fruiting body through its skull, scattering spume over new generations of ants, soon to be fungal zombies themselves, is more than kissing cousin to this local candida. Whether a week or a month after you let leaven flourish, you develop alien tastes or ambrosia, cosmopolitans, shots of corn syrup, chocolate rice crispy treats as offerings to honor your fungal overlords. If as joints stiffen and organs stagger, ghostly fungus flowers, translucent in daylight, would begin to bloom from nose, eyes, scalp, turn their stipes toward the dark of the moon, flutter their delicately fleshy gills to spray spores, colonizing first pets, then spouse, then students in the classes, which by then you will have begun teaching in near darkness presenting slide after strange slide on mycology's seductive study, the endless uses and virtues of the humble yeast, pale spirits of the dusk and the dew, fermenters of wine, inheritors of the earth. Thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine. Way to bring us out with a bang or a burn. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you all so much for coming and uh, I, I told Mary I was going to jump in because I need to thank all these wonderful familiar names and faces I see. I wanted to call your attention to the fact that all five of our honorees from last year's content, uh, contest are completely new to having their poetry published in NCLR. Um, uh, so, you know, I hope that people out there, you know, join our family. It's ever growing. Some people return year after year, like Catherine, uh, like uh, Robert Hill, who I saw is out there somewhere. And, um, and then we have new people every year. Uh, it's always fun for me when Jeff sends his selections of who will go on to the final judge, and I get to start putting the names and and um, poems together and, and then looking up who are these people while I wait on the final judge um, to make his or her decision. So Catherine, you will serve in that capacity this year and I thank you for doing that for us. Um, I hope that all the poets out there will submit again. There's no rule about submitting more than one year at a time. It's uh, everything's completely anonymous. So no one knows except me. I watch from behind the scenes and enjoy it. it it's my little pleasure to do that. Uh, one of the best things about being an editor is making that, uh, sending out that message that says, guess what you want or second place or third place, honorable mention, or we're publishing your poem. All of that is so fun. Um, I did want to say, since we have our poetry editor here, and I'm here, if anyone has questions about the James Applewhite Poetry Prize or about MCLR, we would be happy because we uh, are only at 744, so we've got some time. So if people who have questions, I'd be happy to answer. Or Jeff will. I doubt that, but you know, <laughs> we should all we should all thank Margaret for making. NCLR, a home for poetry sure. in North Carolina. Well, Je Jeff can't get away from me. He moved away in 2000, and I haven't let him go yet uh, from <laughs> reading poetry for NCLR because I trust him entirely. And so I know that uh, I will always end up with wonderful poetry in the issues. Any questions from anyone? Just jump in. Margaret, it's Ron. Uh, I, Ron. I, just, I'm st I am stunned by the, 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 the consistency of uh, all, all, all the readers. It's been really amazing. And Keely, you're way too young to be writing masterpieces. It's just, it's just <laughs> incredible. Thank you, Ron. Ron has published his fiction in our pages in the past. And so 
another member of the family? Anybody else? Any questions for any of the writers? Any of the poets who read tonight? I had a question for Jeff about the form of that first poem he read. Um, there were some cycling lines that kept coming back. I was curious what kind of form that was. You know, um, James Fenton's poem um, in a notebook is, it's actually a poem about the Vietnam War, but it, it's written in A, B, A, B, um, C, C rhyming pattern. And I sort of added some repetition of lines in a, you know, and you, you love working with repetition in that same way, Gideon, I know. So, um, yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah. I have a question about sound to anyone, any one of the poets that might want to uh, take it. Um, I, I'm, I'm reading uh, William Stafford and, and uh, Richard Hugo these days, and they both talk about sound and how you don't have to plan meaning that, that you can go into sound and just bask in, in the sensuality of it. And I felt that from, from our readers tonight. And I was wondering how many of you really kind of like literally kind of take that way into poetry by, you know, emphasizing sound and just kind of let the meaning rise out of it. <clears throat> Does that make sense as a question? Yeah, I wanted, I think that's a good segue into Gideon playing the flute. And I don't know, Gideon, if mm -hmm. playing the flute um, helps your poetry, but I play music and I play it often before I write, not always. And I think that music has a strong force, whether it's subtle or not, in how I think of lines and how poetry comes to me. And I think there's certainly some comorbidity in art, in art forms. I think also the reading it around makes us realize not just where lines break, but also we we learn about the pace of the words and we all need to remember that this is a spoken art form. I've always been a great fan of Seamus Heaney who used very simple language to create such powerful meaning. And you and he said in a, in a book that I read once that his his earliest poetic influence was listening to the old men in his neighborhood as a boy listening to them tell their story and he fell in love with the rhythm of their storytelling voices I think that that's a lesson for all of us yeah I'll just say that I I believe in the musicality of language and I look for poems that have a sense of musicality and a sense of line. And that's part of the criteria that I use in selecting finalists. And um, I feel reaffirmed because all of you just sounded beautiful tonight. Mm -hmm. I remember back when Jeff first uh, started reading poetry for me, he would he was teaching me too, because I was coming to understand his vision. And when I visited him in Colorado, we would sit down and read the, the, the poems. He read them with me once and, and showed me his selections. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm always learning. Poetry was never my genre, so I'm very lucky to have Jeff. I think the question about musicality is really an important one. Um, and and I, I guess I'm, I've been very much embedded in music all my life, uh, classical music, blues, whatever. Uh, but it strikes me that uh, sometimes uh, beginning poets, young poets, seem to feel that you have to start with one or the other. And my experience has been that if you enter a line or you enter a phrase, uh, you may hear the musicality first or you may hear the words first and they're different. And what you do as a, when you're revising and thinking through a poem, you test one against the other throughout that process. So it's never just, 
okay, I've got the meter, I've got that fixed now, that you have to test it against whatever new revision you bring. And then that has to be tested back against the ear. And at, 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 at some very important level for me, this is just the personal experience. That's why the poetry matters to me as I'm working on it. That it's the being in touch with the sound and the meaning as they oscillate inside me. And we hope that it will matter to someone else as well. Um, I, I, I'm always nervous when people say, is it the music first or the words first? Or is it the meaning first or the sound first? And my thought is it's, it, it has to somehow be a texture, a whole texture. I think it works with prose as well, by the way. The fiction, great fiction writers know this as well, uh, from Hemingway to Faulkner. They know how that language works back and forth from music to meaning. Okay, I've spoken too much, but thank you. Thank you, Robert. Another many time finalist in the Applewhite uh, mm -hmm. contest. Uh, we've enjoyed your poetry these many years too. Thank you. Anybody else? I, um, this week, one of my students gave a presentation on David Joy's work and he talked about reading poetry and, and you can hear the poetry in his prose like Robert was just saying. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and he talked about it, it came to my class virtually um, sometime this week. I don't know what day it is. <laughs> <laughs> and, and talked to him about it. It was really great. Um, well, Mary, I'll turn it back over to you then. All right, thanks, Dr. Bauer. And thank, thank you, you all, to all the poets who read tonight. I can't wait to read more of your upcoming works. Um, poets in the audience, don't forget to submit your poems to the 2021 James Applewhite Prize, which ends April 30th. Again, Catherine Carter is serving as the final judge this year. Finalists will be published in um, the upcoming issue. They're chosen by our poetry editor, Jeffrey Franklin. There's no submission fee, but you do need to subscribe to submit. Subscribe today or tomorrow and take advantage of that special offer that we will send you a 2007 issue. The link to the subscription information is in the chat. At this time, we'd love it if you could all answer just one more poll question that will be appearing on your screen. And I'd like to say thank you to Sean for all your hard work behind the scenes, to Catherine, to Wayne, Jeffrey, and all of our Apple White Prize poets for participating in tonight's event. Thank you viewers for tuning in tonight and supporting the North Carolina Literary Review. You can follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, and Instagram to keep up to date on all of our upcoming events and contests. Thank you again to the ECU Alumni Association for co-hosting tonight's event. I'd like to wish everyone health and wellness while we continue on in this bizarre and trying time. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. It's great to put faces and names together. It was truly an honor to listen to you all read your work. Thank you.